Welcome back. This is lesson number 27, Citizenship. Citizenship follows chapters 13 and 14 in our textbook. Citizenship often comes up in our A1 part of our diploma exam and unit exams, as some of the sources may be exposing an issue with our relationship with our government and may be calling upon change for the action of citizens. Citizenship can also come up on an essay as we try to determine which political system best fits the needs of the citizens. And of course, citizenship could come up on the multiple choice as well. I'm going to begin with a quote. Considering mankind's indifference to freedom, their easy gullibility, and their facile response to conditioning, one might very plausibly argue that collectivism is the political mode best suited to their disposition and their capabilities. Under its regime, the citizen, like the soldier, is relieved of the burden of initiative and is divested of all responsibility, saving, save for doing as he is told. So, again, we, we need to take archive, take inventory, take stock of the arguments being presented to you. Here's an argument being presented to you. An argument that you could build an essay around or an argument you can build an essay against. But it's that kind of language in your writing that we're looking for to get to that E. All right. To what extent should our actions and should the actions of the state promote happiness? And to what extent should our happiness be contrary to doing our duty? So we have things like utilitarianism and deontology that can wrestle with the idea of what is the path to true happiness. So in the beginning here, we have some uh, opening thoughts, if you will, some things to ponder, some things to kind of set the stage. Citizenship makes us a party to a contract with the state. Unless we emigrate, we have no right to refute its laws. So Plato, in the 4th century BCE, is suggesting that if you live in America, you must do as American laws say. Uh, obviously, there was no America as the United States of America in the 4th century BCE. Plato's primary influence was the 399 BCE death of Socrates, who had been charged with subverting Athens' youth. So what we're assuming then is obedience, and we ignore the responsibility to voice our discontent when there is a lack of justice. This is different than others. So the White Rose Movement during the German occupation of much of Europe during World War II is an example of individuals that may argue against Plato and the idea that uh, you know unless you're going to emigrate, you have to respect the laws. Well, for them, the laws were, were not just, and therefore they protested them, um, very much underground if need be. Another example is Thoreau and his idea of, of protesting unjust laws and uh, not paying taxes and going to jail if need be in order to prevent paying taxes to support policies of your government, policies that you don't believe with. So uh, Thoreau didn't want to see America and his president Polk uh, going to war with Mexico. So he thought, I don't want my property taxes, my, my income taxes. I don't want taxes in general, sorry. I, I don't want my taxes being used to pay for a war machine to go in and invade and imperialize other people. The society that abolishes every adventure makes its own abolition the only possible adventure. So if society, if the state abolishes every bit of citizenship and adventure, then the state itself will also be abolished. We've got some visuals here on citizenship. Uh, one thing I'd like you to be able to uh, communicate is what are the responsibilities of a citizen? So in a community, how can a citizen be responsible? 
Is it obeying laws? Is it questioning unjust laws? Is it paying taxes? Is it recycling? Is it giving blood? Is it volunteering? Is it trying to solve social and economic problems within your community by displaying good moral, good character, being honest, being responsible, and, and helping those who need assistance? How do we participate as citizens? How do we engage each other in our community? These are things that you should be ready to write about in part A of, of the diploma exam. What does it mean to be a justice-orientated citizen? Uh, how do justice-orientated citizens respond when they see injustice? How do you seek solutions to injustice? Is it uh, acceptable to become violent and loot and use arson and engage in firefights with the police in the streets? Is that a justice-orientated citizen responding to injustice through violence? So the concept is citizenship, and we do have a prezi, as we often do, to help uh, fill in some of the nuances of this for us. And uh, if we were in class, we'd watch this prezi together. I'm going to skip the videos. I don't need you to watch me watch a video. But there will be some video links within this Prezi that you can always go back to for sure. So, citizenship. What makes a good citizen? Is it obedience? Is it sacrifice? Must you defend the body politic with your life? Is it service? Is it service to the community? Is it service to the state? Is it blind service? Do we follow? Or can we question the state? Is obedience a big part? That's a key word. And authoritarian states would like to see obedience in their citizens. What are some rights, roles, and responsibilities of citizens? Should we have respect for law and order? Now, in the United States of today, we don't see a lot of respect for law and order. What kind of relationship should we have with the police, as the police are part of the executive branch of government? They are carrying out the laws. How should we relate to them? How do we relate to unjust laws? Like, wooden logs may not be painted. Or, when raining, a person may not water his lawn. Now, these are silly unjust laws, but there are unjust laws that we can see are creating uh, heightened tensions in, in the world and in the United States today. What about political participation? Is that a key role of a citizen? Now, this lady is celebrating the fact that she voted at what could be an expense to her own life. In Iraq, when the Americans imposed liberalism and created a democratic state and tried to have open and free elections, uh, many opposed the democracy, tried to use intimidation to discourage people from voting. One of the methods was to cut off fingers of people that had this purple mark on it. They have a purple mark because they voted. That's the way to stop them from voting multiple times. The mark's gonna last you know, roughly a week. But those who don't want people voting, if they see someone with a purple mark, they might lob that finger off as a warning to the community. Humanitarianism. Is this a role that citizens play? Do we have a responsibility for all of humankind? All of people kind? Civil disobedience and protest. When should we protest? Should we protest? Does citizenship change during times of war? Is it no longer acceptable to question the government during a times of crisis? Alberta Ed loves to use the times of crisis scenario to try to get you to uh, refocus on what kind of relationship we should have between the government and governed. So during a time of economic crisis like we've had in, in Canada since uh, March of 2020, uh, should we be questioning the state or should we allow the Trudeau administration to spend $250 billion extra dollars and uh, create more than 25% of additional debt in Canada at the expense of decades of taxpayers so that we can have a more comfortable three months.
Anti-war movements. Can we protest those? Protest for democracy, like at Tiananmen Square in 1989. What about using your music as a you know, platform for creating some kind of social or political change? Now, the Dixie Chicks, now just known as the Chicks, because Dixie seems a little too, you know, Southern, uh, the Dixie Chicks, uh, during the war in Iraq, this is 2003, they questioned the George W. Bush policy going to war in Iraq, and uh, many Southern radio stations said, you know what, we're not going to play your music. You can't question the government during war. That's unpatriotic. What about global citizenship? Do our responsibilities to each other stop at the border? Or do we have responsibilities for citizens that uh, may be of another nation state. So if we do have responsibility to citizens in other countries, then what does that mean for immigration policies? Global issues. How do we tackle climate change as a citizen? What's our responsibility? How do we attack climate chaos, extreme weather, natural disasters, ecological destruction? Habitat destruction. How do we attack desertification? How do we attack ozone depletion? How do we attack water and air contamination? How do we attack animal extinction as a citizen? What do you do? Can you do something different? Can you buy clothing differently? Can you transport yourself differently? How do we respond to famine when there is someone dying every five seconds of famine how do we or do we respond to that maybe we're just overwhelmed now america responds they send food and they feed third world countries but it's easier to hate america maybe we want to join the peace brigade international and be a part of that solution maybe you have missionary work through your church these are all parts of the idea of what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be a citizen? So an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic, ah, let's get rid of the ick, individualist concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity, accepting personal responsibility for the safety of the body politic, defending it with his life. That's a quote from the movie Starship Troopers. So we also have the idea of, you know, do we have obligations? Are citizens obligated? Are there things that we must do? And there's a Prezi that you can go down and look at obligations as well. Um, we're not going to look at each Prezi together. One thing I'd like you to do is be able to compare and contrast the uh, responsibilities of citizens in the United States with other countries, South Korea, Israel, the service that the Israelis have for the defense of their country, surrounded by others who want them to be, you know, driven in, in, into the Mediterranean Sea, surrounded by others who want to see um, Arabs control the Holy Land, not, not Israeli Jews. What does activism look like? Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is in prison. That sounds like Henry David Thoreau. That sounds like Gandhi. Uh, that sounds like activism and disobedience. So be the change in all the different hashtag movements that have changed the world. So here's a quick video. You don't have time for the other ones. Here's a quick one that summarizes some protests that have changed the world. One of the key ones people might focus on is Tiananmen Square or maybe the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which is in the textbook in Chapter 13. Got lots of video on anti-protests. It is very common uh, on the diploma to test you with this by presenting you a photo on an A1 where you have to dissect a photo and say, okay, what's the problem 
that they're seeing in society? What's the solution that they see for the problem? What are some values attached to that solution? How can these values be shown as an ideological perspective? Who might use philosophy or history or contemporary events to further the ideological perspective and prove that argumentation correct? Who might see a flaw of logic or a bias or a limitation in this ideological perspective and argue against it? And why is this issue important? What's the significance? What will happen if it's not addressed? That needs to be pulled out from photographs like this one. End the war in Vietnam. So we got lots of quotes from, Viet, uh, from the war in Vietnam, including from Muhammad Ali. I ain't draft dodging. I ain't burning no flag. I ain't running to Canada. I'm staying right here. You want to send me to jail? Fine. You can go right ahead. I've been in jail for 400 years. That's the worst Muhammad Ali accent you'll ever hear. But there it is. So before we had Black Lives Matter, we had Black Power. And here we have at the uh, 1968 Summer Olympic Games in Mexico City, we have two American athletes showing their solidarity with the African-American community. Um, Later on, this guy was interviewed, and he's like, oh, hey, thanks for telling me what's up, guys. We also have some issues of citizenship. How do you respond to um, segregation in places like South Africa with apartheid? You know, what is the responsibility for Dutch Afrikaners living within a segregate system when they are the whites that actually have rights? Do they have a responsibility to the blacks of South Africa? Do people outside of South Africa have a responsibility to the people living within South Africa during the time of oppression? Trevor Noah, the, community, the comedian, has a, a quick video here about how he was born a crime because he comes from an interracial relationship. Uh, democracy, one way, WTO the other way. Here's another form of uh, activism, this time against globalism and against uh, you know, the march of global economics of, of trade liberalism and suggesting that if we embrace capitalism, what we lose is democracy. So there's this idea that um, political individualism is lost if we practice economic individualism. Because what we end up getting is, is elitism and corptocracy. Here's somebody questioning Donald Trump after he's elected president. Uh, you wouldn't see that in a state that wasn't free and democratic. Here's the illusion of democracy. Uh, man, there's some rich sources in this document. So take some time, break this down. What's going on here? Life time debt. Oh, that, that could be basically any Canadian taxpayer right now. Um, politics and cronies and capitalists. All, oh, man, this, I know it's supposed to probably be the United States, but uh, this could be Canada, the illusion of democracy. We've got these politicians up top, and they're capitalist oligarchs that support them. And here we are, down at the bottom, supporting the system, thinking it's a democracy, thinking it's our will that empowers them. But in fact, we're simply just uh, being, being created into a new form of servitude. But it's a willing servitude. We're willing slaves. Ah, uh, Kanye, you be careful. You be careful, Kanye. Um, protest in democracy versus dictatorship. We have a prezi that also includes the concept with uh, Tank Man. This looks at the difference of what a protest would look like in a democracy versus what protests might look like in a dictatorship. There's that obligations one that you could look at later if you wish. So we do have some prezies that you can go to to, uh, you know, go down the rabbit hole a little bit more. Um, I know prezi is, is not the only way that we can communicate to each other, but it certainly can help. Um, so can you spot the difference? We've got protests in a liberal society and protests against authoritarian states. Now, unfortunately, um, this is actually in the United States. This is the Haymarket riots. Uh, unfortunately, this shows that in the United States, often they act 
uh, how you would expect to see them, the government would act, how you'd expect them to see them in an authoritarian state. And again, we call that illiberalism. Illiberalism, right? When the liberal democracy begins to behave like a non-liberal authoritarian state. We have some other protests here from Greece and from France. Some protests more today. We've got the idea of who is running America. Who is running America. We have a great video. This is amazing, but it's 30 minutes long. So I get it if you don't watch it. But Huxley, the author of Brave New World, really captures the role of citizens uh, well before his time. Got some more quotes that you can break down on citizenship. Some ideas about the Orange Revolution. People do like to talk about that in essays. It comes up on the multiple choice. It's in the textbook, so that's fair game. We have some ideas about lobby groups. So here's a quote about the military-industrial complex as a lobby group and the undue influence that they have on public policy as a warning from the outgoing president, um, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, it's not typical that an outgoing president would use his his farewell address to issue a warning to a group of corporations and military contacts that have an undue influence on government policy. But uh, this is a call for an alert citizens. We face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheist in character, ruthless in purpose, and insidious in method. But our biggest threat to liberalism comes from within our liberal democracy. In light of unjustified government spending proposals, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought by the military-industrial complex. I do not disagree with the imperative need for military development, but the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Security and liberty, that's the goal, to have you know, your freedoms protected, but also still feel safe. And he's saying the only way to do that is to have active citizens. There's another cartoon about uh, the undue influence of the military-industrial complex and the power of lobby groups. We've already seen this very cartoon on diploma exams. Uh, but this idea, this concept of the 1% manipulating the other 99%, uh, the Occupy movement, uh, this idea is, is very um, connected to this part of the course. You know, the idea that the 1%, the elite, are able to manipulate and basically hijack the government process uh, through campaign contributions and end up, the rest of us have no influence on them. So Dwight D. Eisenhower wanted to have corporate tax rate of 90%. Why? Because high corporate tax rates create incentives for big business to spend on things like new locations, new hires, new equipment, product research and development, which are deducted from taxable earnings. In other words, it's better to spend a majority of earnings on expansion than to hoard it and pay Uncle Sam 90% of it. It's not communism, it's reasonable economics. That would be brilliant to have, but in Canada, our corporate tax rates are less than 40%. And in Alberta, they're less than 30%. And instead of having corporations invest in Alberta's economy in the future through the expansion that Dwight D. Eisenhower wants there in reasonable economics, what do they do? They take that money offshore and they invest in real estate and drugs and things like that. I'm starting to feel cynical. So here's another cartoon looking at the undue influence of corporations, how they have access to government, but the people don't. And what gives them access? Money gives them access. So another cartoon that you could break down for sure. Another cartoon here. We've seen this one in, in another um, lesson that I've already presented to you about the undue influence of lobby groups. This is suggesting that U.S. corporations have uh, a special position in terms of the judicial branch that we the people do not have so that maybe corporate corporations uh, corporations are not great citizens we have people like antifa that believe that citizenship means uh, you know looting and rioting and, and destroying the system as it is through violence so that they can create a new system and we have the arab spring and the practice of self -emu emulation 
Um, this comes up a lot on the diploma exam as well. The idea that this is a testimony of a citizen who goes to a great length to say that, you know, sacrifices his life to say that uh, the state is so toxic, so poisonous that he's unwilling to live under that state. So this is a case study, a contemporary case study about extreme citizen activism and disobedience by saying, I will, I will take my life before I will succumb to your economic corruption. We've got some other thoughts as we finish up about the role of the state and the role of citizens and some questions to have you ponder. So that, my friends, was citizenship.